In the foothills of Greenock, Scotland, an invention is brewing. Robert Tom has been hard at work creating his masterpiece, an energy system that would bury James Watt's upstart steam engine once and for all. The year is 1824, and Tom is fresh off a success with the nearby cotton mills in Rothsay, where he implemented an energy system that knocked the socks off of the factory owners there. A snippet from Mechanics Magazine at the time claimed that the power of the Rothsay mills was more than doubled and the proprietors were enabled to lay aside their steam engines entirely. And so Robert Tom submitted the blueprint for his magnum opus to the town of Greenock, sure that they would accept his plans with open arms. And how could they not? His designs would provide dirt cheap, abundant energy to the 33 cotton mills in the area. Robert Tom would help fuel a cottonopolis the likes of which the United Kingdom had never seen, and it would all be run on water. That's right, 55 years after James Watt received his patent for the steam engine, Robert Tom was building a superior energy system built on water. One that would more than double the energy capacity of the factories of Greenock while supplying power at one-eighth the cost of steam. Yet Tom's grand vision for Greenock was never fully realized. As we all know, the steam engine and its fossil fuel descendants were the eventual victors. We live in a world of fossil fuels, not water power. Robert Tom's water-powered world has been shoved into the bookcases of history. So what happened? How did steam and ultimately the fossil fuels that powered it win the historical battle of energy, especially when it was more expensive and less efficient than its water-powered competition? This is the story of steam's rise to power, why the history of fossil fuels you think you know is probably wrong, and why the foundations of steam's success are rooted in the dungeons of capitalist production. But before we dive into those dungeons, it's important to note that this video is heavily based off of the findings and analysis of Andreas Malm in his book Fossil Capital. If you're interested in learning more in depth about this history, definitely buy the book or rent it from your library. It's a must read. This video is better on Nebula. Use the link in the description below to support our changing climate directly by signing up for Nebula. There you can watch this video ad free and also watch over 25 OCC videos that I haven't released on YouTube, including next month's video about fossil capital and today's current economy, the age of imperialism. The adoption of steam power and ultimately the industrialization and solidification of fossil fuels as the primary energy source for the world's economy can first be found in England during the late 18th and early 19th century. There, a showdown of different energies took place in the bowels of cotton factories, an industry booming with the thirst of a newly minted capitalist enterprise. The textile industry emerged in 18th century England off of the back of what Andreas Malm calls animate power in his book Fossil Capital. This is the power derived from animals or humans, like using draft horses to spin wheels for factory work. But with the massive boom of the cotton industry in the late 1700s, animate power soon limited factory production. Horses could only pull so much and had to rest and eat. People needed to sleep and ran out of energy. They were a bottleneck to factory owners eager to expand production and ultimately profit. So those capitalists soon turned towards the landscape for power. They began to harness the limitless energies of water, what Malm calls the flow of energy. It is here where, as we will soon see, industrial capitalism was built. The flow, or the energy derived from the direct harnessing of wind or water, allowed factory owners to break away from the shackles of draft horses and hand-powered spinning wheels. Water power, unlike horses, couldn't be exhausted. It was an endless stream of energy if you just harnessed it correctly. But quickly, an upstart competitor to the flow as the primary form of power bared its teeth in the cotton industry. The power of the sun buried deep and fossilized, what we now call fossil fuels or what Andreas Malm calls the stock. The stage was set for a battle between the stock and flow, and the battlegrounds were the cotton factories of England. But there wasn't a linear transition from animate power to water power to fossil fuels. The road was bumpy and complicated, and the myths of history blind us to the real reasons why steam and fossil fuels were ultimately adopted over water. As soon as James Watt invented the steam engine, the world was changed forever. One man caused the fossil fuel economy that we're now locked into today. At least, that's how the common thinking goes. The ideas of one great man of history altered the course of that history. 
But the adoption of the steam engine and fossil fuels at an industrial level wasn't a simple switch off from water to steam. Factory owners didn't just destroy their water wheels as soon as James Watt received his patent. The march of progress is charted not just by the introduction and invention of new technologies, but by the economic and social relations formed around those new technologies. The steam engine is an inert object. It has no control over people. New technologies only take root when the right people, which is the capitalist class, own them and are able to extract profit from them, especially when they're able to use those machines to wield power over other classes. Indeed, it took 52 years from 1784 to around 1836 for steam power to take over as the source of the majority of power in industrial England. The steam engine by no means was adopted immediately. And when it was, it was slow and patchy. In addition, fossil fuels and the steam they created for power didn't give rise to industrial capitalism. In fact, it was just the opposite. Industrial capitalism was already firmly established before fossil fuels gained supremacy. Because for most of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, England's factories, especially cotton mills, were run on water power. In 1824, the lions of Catrin roared with the tumult of water. Two massive water wheels that powered the booming factories of cotton tycoon Kirkman Finlay. Despite the growing popularity of steam at the time, Finlay, a tremendously successful cotton capitalist, went big on water. And he did it for a simple reason. In a transcript from an 1833 parliamentary inquiry, Finlay reveals that his massive water mills allowed him to have power for nothing and in abundance. In short, Finlay bet big on water mills to power his growing factories because, once constructed, they could supply immense power reserves for little to no cost. This was surprisingly common during the first half of the 18th century. In 1800, 70% of the power pouring into the cotton industry came from water, while coal only made up 20%. Water was a common resource that was delivered to mills free of charge by the landscape. The only real cost of fuel for water mills was what it took to construct the sluices and wheels to create power. And once those were paid off, the power was essentially free, leading to cotton capitalists and newspapers claiming as far into the mid-1840s when steam had already overtook water power as the primary source of energy, that water power could save at least 500 pounds per annum, and that it was a well-ascertained fact that water power is cheaper than steam. So even as steam overtook water power, steam was still more expensive, in part due to the labor needed to rip coal from the earth and transport it to factories and steam engines. Labor that was unnecessary for water mills. Indeed, one of the first steam engines adopted by a cotton factory in England in 1786 rarely used their engine on account of the high cost of fuel. The midwife of the birth of industrial capitalism then was not the stock, but instead the flow the power of water. As Mom points out in Fossil Capital, the transition to steam didn't happen because water was superior. In fact, steam gained supremacy in spite of water being abundant, cheaper, and at least as powerful, even, and efficient. For all intents and purposes, water power was a superior vehicle for power in the 1800s. So why, by 1836, did steam power finally overtake water as a primary form of energy for industrial capital? What actually drove the transition? For that answer, we need to delve into the depths of the cotton factories themselves. With the rise of industrial capitalism in England, and the rise of the industrial capitalist class, came also the rise of the industrial working class. Former peasants and tenant farmers who were either forced from their livelihoods by lords enclosing and privatizing common land, or those in the countryside merely looking for a way to survive, flocked into urban centers throughout England. From 1700 to 1800, England's population grew from 5 million to 9 million. And by the 1851 census, over half of the population resided in urban centers. And just 39 years after that, the percentage ticked up to 61.9%. England's cities were booming, and this new urban labor force was a factory owner's dream. If your factory was in the right spot, that is. The abundant urban population of workers searching for work meant that factory owners could pit laborers against each other, driving wages down for the same amount of work. Sucking ever more profits from their workers through increasingly longer workdays and low wages, cotton factory owners churned out textiles at an ever-growing rate, and with it accumulated ever more profits. 
The turn of the 19th century marked the birth of industrial capitalism in England, and at the center of it all was the cotton industry. There, water-powered mills, which were subject to the whims of seasonality and flow, became sites of gruesome exploitation. In order to make up for lost time and ultimately lost profits from a mill slowing down during droughts or when the river was weak, factory owners would push their workers to labor extra hours when the river's flow was strong. This led to an unpredictable schedule for laborers. One cotton spinner, Isabella Key, was noted saying that in order to make up time, she has known them to go from 5 in the morning till half past 9 o'clock in the evening. While another cotton worker claimed that the children were forced in activity from 4 to 5 o'clock in the morning to 9 or 10 at night. But the factory owners of England didn't enjoy their profits peacefully for very long. Their world, which was at the time powered by water, was now under threat from the very laborers they were exploiting for profit. The factory workers banded together. They began to strike. From 1825 to the 1850s, a factory movement agitated for change throughout England's industrial sector, especially within the cotton industry. This was a tumultuous time for the cotton sector. As cotton spinners organized walkouts and actively damaged equipment, factory owners tightened their grip on labor. Increasing discipline and enforcement, and using the growing population of unemployed laborers in urban centers as a threat of replacement to those on strike. But for many factories who sought more rural areas with strong river currents to maximize the power of their water mills, this wasn't possible. There was no reserve army of workers in the countryside a significant disadvantage that we will soon dive into. But despite capitalist pressure on workers, the strikes and labor agitation did achieve some victories. And one of the most impactful was the Factory Act of 1833, which increased the oversight and crackdown on exploitation of mill workers. Together with the passage of the 10-hour workday law in 1850, workers achieved some semblance of relief under the toil of the cotton mill. But for a water-powered cotton factory, the 10-hour workday was a brutal nail in the coffin. Cotton capitalists, especially those who held to their water-powered energy sources, were especially vulnerable. They were bound in space by the tremendous amount of money they poured into building their water mills, what's called fixed capital, as well as in time. Their water mills could only churn out profit when the current was fast and no ice was blocking the route. So the Factory Act and the improvement of worker conditions gained from labor uprisings throughout the first half of the 1850s were a disaster for all cotton factory owners, but especially those those who still relied on water to power their mills. And within the Factory Act and the enforcement of the 10-hour day, we can begin to see why and how fossil fuels overtook water as the primary source of energy. It wasn't because it was cheaper, it wasn't because it was more powerful. Instead, it had to do with the control of labor. 1842 marked a pivotal moment in the activation of England's workforce. It was the year of one of the biggest revolts of that century, commonly known as the General Strike of 1842, or to those at the time, the Plug Riots. Uprisings across the English industrial working class sought to force the capitalist class to submit to their demands through the dismantling of plugs attached to steam engines on factory floors, bringing production to a screeching halt. So by 1842, revolting workers were sabotaging fossil-fueled machines in order to exert their worker power. According to Malm in Fossil Capital, reports from just one small wool industry town claimed that 38 factories had their plugs drawn, and another account from one rioter in Leeds claims to have knocked out 13 plugs in just one morning. These are small glimpses of this fossil fuel sabotage. Indeed, the phrase stop the smoke became a rallying cry for industrial workers during the 1842 uprising. Because the labor force of 19th century England knew what now seems to be lost to history. Factory owners were implementing steam power and ultimately fossil fuels, not because they were cheaper, but because it was the best way to assert control over their labor force. As Marx writes, machinery doesn't just act as a superior competitor to the worker, always on the point of making him superfluous. It is a power inimical to him. It is the most powerful weapon for suppressing strikes, those periodic revolts of the working class against the autocracy of capital. But why exactly was the stock better than the flow for capitalist control over their workers? Malm argues that steam had distinct advantages in both time and space for the capitalist class, despite water power being less expensive and just as powerful. Taking a step back to the water-powered mill for a moment, we can see the common advantage of the flow in space. Water-powered cotton mills were, by their nature, bound to the river. 
They couldn't stray too far from where the current ran the strongest, because otherwise their power source and ultimately production would suffer. Paradoxically, for factory owners, the flow of water forced them into a fixed location, often away from urban centers where the workforce was the biggest. This meant that owners of water-powered factories had to essentially build a village around their factories, creating a factory colony. And the workers that lived around that factory were the only laborers available. As novelist Sir Walter Scott notes at the time, when the machinery was driven by water, the manufacturer had to seek out a sequestered spot, and then his workmen formed the inhabitants of a village around him, and he necessarily bestowed some attention to them. Scott goes on to add that with the steam engine, things changed. The manufacturers are transferred to great towns, where a man may assemble 500 workmen one week and dismiss them in the next. In short, water power required the capitalist class to bring the people to power. Steam, and the fossil fuels that ran with it, was much more flexible in space. While definitely more expensive, it was cheap in the sense that factory owners could locate their fixed capital where there was a massive reserve labor force city centers. Steam engines meant that factory owners could take advantage of the abundance of unemployed wage laborers flocking to cities in 19th century England. People who could easily be cast aside and substituted if they ever got unruly. Essentially, the labor force in urban centers were more amenable to the exploitation of cotton capitalists because there were so many of them and there were so few options other than to work in the factories. So for steam, capitalists could bring power to people and in doing so, tap into a consistent and more exploitable workforce. As one cotton capitalist and early adopter of steam engine argued, waterfalls became of less value. Instead of carrying the people to the power, it was found preferable to place the power amongst the people. But steam also had an advantage in terms of time. To understand just how advantageous it was for steam, we have to, once again, go back to water power. With the passage of the 10-hour workday mandate in 1850, water mills were in dire straits. Indeed, in the years leading up to the bill, water-powered factory owners raised hell about a potential restriction of working hours. A factory owner in Yorkshire claimed that if this bill becomes a law, the effects would be to destroy many water mills entirely in rural situations in the country. While another factory owner lamented, had we been restricted to 10 hours, the whole value of the property would be sacrificed. A shortened and inflexible workday was a catastrophic threat to the water mill owner. Water power was only valuable to owners when they could force their laborers to work to the rhythm of the river. Because water mills had such a high upfront cost, from building the wheels and the infrastructure in rural areas, factory owners who wanted to maximize their profit needed to make sure their workers were working at every hour the mill was producing power. This could mean 16 hour days to make up for dry spells or weak currents. It also meant that a restriction on how many hours laborers could work would drastically reduce the profitability of the mill. Enter the steam engine, a machine reliant on the consistent energy of fossil fuels. A machine that allowed capitalists to reliably maximize the production of their factories within that restricted time frame. Indeed, the coal-fired steam engine held within it the potential to continually be refined in advance so that it could create more energy and power, pushing machines to spin faster and ultimately for workers to produce faster in a given amount of time. Essentially, coal-powered steam provided factory owners the ability and control to continuously ratchet up production within the 10-hour day, working laborers harder and always at the same time of day. So in the centuries-old struggle between labor and capital, steam power was used to bludgeon workers back down into their place. Despite gains in factory conditions for workers, steam allowed capitalists to produce ever more and accumulate ever more profits. Steam won the day, both for the factory owners over their workers and over the flow of water power. By 1870, the battle between coal and water was all but over. Coal and the steam power that it created had all but eviscerated its water-powered competitors. Coal won out not because it was cheaper. Indeed, the actual cost of fossil fuel power was more expensive than that of water. Nor did it win out because it supplied more energy. 
It won because it allowed the factory owners, and indeed the capitalist class as a whole, to assert superior control over their workers. In particular, steam was able to squash the weaknesses of water through consistency in time and spatial flexibility. In a time of worker uprisings, factory owners needed a tool to continue to produce as much profit as possible out of their factories, and water power just wasn't cutting it. Steam was the answer. So contrary to the idea that fossil fuels kickstarted the industrial revolution, or the idea that the steam engine was invented and immediately adopted, the coal-powered steam engine was a tool used to consolidate and protect the growing power of capitalists in a time of crisis. Fossil fuels allowed capitalists to wring more value out of each and every worker they paid. Essentially, steam mobilized the working class for the enrichment of the capitalist class. And in doing so, locked in an economy based on and built around the extraction and burning of fossil fuels. But this transition from water to fossil fuels isn't just a moment of history stuck in time. Its lessons are crucial to understanding our current predicament. Its tendrils lash out and strike at the current attempts for an energy transition. Which is why next month's video will bring this history of steam power to the current day, looking at what this nascent fossil economy has morphed into. It's a part two to this video breaking down the undeniable environmental destruction of fossil capital. These imperial tentacles of capital reaching across the globe are facilitated by the engines of fossil fuel extraction. And because of the generous support of Nebula members, you can watch that video right now, a month early, on the creator-owned streaming service Nebula. This means that the longer we wait, not only will we slip deeper into the climate crisis, but it will be harder to climb out of the hole the forces of fossil capital are digging. There you can watch 25 bonus and extended OCC videos alongside a ton of other exclusive and early content from creators like Not Just Spikes and Johnny Harris. I highly recommend watching Wendover Productions original video on the logistics and demise of coal mining in the United States. There are no plans to develop any future utility scale coal fired power plants. And on top of all that, Nebula has a whole host of classes from creators like Simon Clark. Story. But how do we actually tell that story in an effective way? And Tom Nichols. How to research like a PhD. Student. Which have definitely upped my video making and storytelling skills. Signing up for Nebula using my link is the best way to support our changing climate. It's like Patreon combined with Netflix, but better for me and you. And I've got an exclusive deal for you right now. If you sign up for Nebula using the link on screen or in the description, you can get 40% off per year, which is just $2.50 a month. Signing up for Nebula is the single best way to support our changing climate. And in the process, you can watch my videos a month early, get access to all my ad-free exclusive videos, and support a blossoming collective of educational creators.